Shem Ava, Wavra, Waruka de Kutcha. Lebedach Yavrivi, Walla, Allaha, Waruka de Kanta had it begal. Maria of Takli Safot, Wafumna's Martyr Pahatach. Tribuk de la Laka Bamrame, Walla Ra Shlama, was of the Tavel of Nainasha. Kadishat Allaha, Kadishat Hailtana, Kishat Lama Yuta at Rahamalain. Kadishat Allaha, Kadishat Hailtana, Kadishat Lama Yuta at Rahamalain. Kadishat Allaha, Kadishat Hailtana, Kadishat Lama Yuta at Rahamalain. Tribuk del Ava, Wallavra, Wallaruka de Kutcha, Hashem of Kulswan, Wallam Almin, Amin. Avund Vishmaya, Netka de Schmach, Tita Malkutach, Nekwe Savianak, a Kanada Vishmaya of Bara, Havlan Lachman de Sulkana, Yamana, Mishfuklan Haban, a Kanada of Nan Shvakan Lachayavan, Lata Alan Linasuna, Allah of San Mibisha. Pray unto God for me, O holy God pleaser, Cyril of Alexandria, for I fervently flee unto thee, the speedy helper and intercessor for my soul. O Theotokos and Virgin, rejoice, Mary, fully of grace, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, for thou hast borne the Savior of our souls. Save, O Lord, thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Grant thou victory to Orthodox Christians over enemies, and by thy power of thy cross do thou, do thou preserve thy commonwealth. Hello and welcome. This video is an introductory presentation on Nestorius and the Assyrian Church of the East. Many people believe that Nestor Nestorius wasn't really a Nestorian, that he was misunderstood that um, and incorrectly condemned, that his theology is actually correct, that he is really a victim. Also, many people believe that the Assyrian Church of the East is wrongly labeled Nestorian in a pejorative sense, that it associates itself with Nestorius. According to the Orthodox Church, Nestorius is unreservedly, rightfully condemned as a heretic, and the Assyrian Church of the East teaches the Nestorian heresy. What exactly do we, Orthodox Christians, mean when we say Nestorianism? By Nestorianism, we mean a two-subject Christology. That Christ has two hypostases, two knome, two concrete existences. We also say that Nestorianism teaches two persons in Christ because for us, person and hypostasis are synonymous. In broadest terms, our condemnation of Nestorius and the Assyrian Church of the East is that they both teach, whether formally or materially, a two-subject Christology. While there are shades of meaning, the Greek hypostasis and the Syriac Knuma, Q-N-U-M-A, are roughly synonymous with each other and quite simply point to the same idea. The underlying reality of someone, the particular being or that which exhibits particular existence, an individual someone, a subsistence. So for example, you and I are both humans in a general sense, we equally have a human nature, but you are your own hypostasis or knuma. You are a particular human. You are your own existence apart from me. You are your own subject. You have your own subsistence. Likewise, I am a hypostasis or knuma. I am a particular human that is different from you. I have an existence distinct from you. I am my own subject. I have my own subsistence. This is what is generally meant by hypostasis and knuma. What sets the Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East apart is that in Orthodoxy, a hypostasis is not 
a priori limited to particularizing a specific nature. So, for example, the divine hypostasis that we know as the Word of God, the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, N hypostatizes the divine nature. Now, a human hypostasis, you and I, N hypostatizes human nature. However, the mystery of Christ's incarnation is such that the divine hypostasis of the word, or logos, N hypostatizes human nature as well. The divine hypostasis itself is the subsistence for the human nature. There is no human hypostasis necessary for the subsistence of Christ's human nature. This is why in orthodoxy, the incarnation is a mystery. Christ, who is the Logos, who is the second person of the Holy Trinity, is the only hypostasis to enhypostatize two natures. The union of the divine and human natures in Christ occurs hypostatically in the sense that the Logos enhypostatizes both natures. For the Assyrian Church of the East, every nature is particularized only by a specific a priori type of hypostasis corresponding specifically to that nature. So, for example, only a divine hypostasis particularizes divine nature, and only a human hypostasis particularizes human nature. You cannot have a divine hypostasis particularize human nature according to the Assyrian Church of the East. The concern is to avoid any semblance of the divine hypostasis undergoing some kind of change such that divine impassibility becomes passable. Orthodoxy does not hold to that understanding, nor do we admit to there being any kind of change undergone by the divine hypostasis in its enhypostatization of human nature. Despite both natures in Christ being enhypostatized by the same hypostasis, both natures in Christ forever remain unconfounded and unmixed. This understanding of enhypostatization is the first point of departure between the Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East. The second point of departure is with regards to certain nuances of Syriac, the language of the Assyrian Church of the East. The preferred nomenclature of the Assyrian Church of the East in Syriac is Knuma and Kiana, K-Y-A-N-A, which roughly translates to hypostasis and essence or nature, respectively. At some point, Kiana was historically supplanted by the Greek word for essence, usia, and is for all intents and purposes synonymous with it. Now, for the Assyrian Church of the East, Every kiana must be expressed by its corresponding knuma. So, for example, human kiana can only ever be expressed by a human knuma. And likewise, divine kiana can only ever be expressed by a divine knuma. The human knuma does not exist apart from the human kiana, nor does the divine knuma exist apart from the divine kiana. Additionally, the knuma is considered the manifestation of activity 
respective of that kiana. So the Assyrian Church of the East recognizes, on the one hand, a static-like subsistence aspect of knuma that is completely identical to the Greek hypostasis, and which is readily translated by the um, word shachs in Arabic. The Nestorian Marbabai the Great freely translates the Greek hypostasis using the Syriac Knuma. But on the other hand, the Assyrian Church of the East understands Knuma to also mean dynamic like activity, respective of the corresponding Kiana, without implying any kind of subsistence. And so the Assyrian Church of the East believes that it can talk about this activity of a knuma without necessarily implying subsistence. The overarching problem is that you cannot describe activities of someone without implying an underlying subsistence. And because the Assyrian Church of the East rigidly holds to the belief that you can only ever have a direct pairing of specific kiana knuma counterparts, so only a human knuma for a human kiana, and only a divine knuma for a divine kiana, then that implies that by having a human knuma, you have a human subsistence. And having a divine knuma, you have a divine subsistence. It's utterly nonsensical to say that you have a knuma, but not admit to a subsistence. You can't talk about someone exhibiting human activity without attaching that activity to some sort of subsistence. Now, the Orthodox have no problem in saying that Christ's human activity is expressed by Christ's divine knuma, which is to say expressed simply by Christ himself. Since for the Orthodox, Christ is the divine hypostasis or divine knuma. It is the divine knuma that is the subsistence for the human kiana. But at no time whatsoever do we say or admit that the divine kiana and the human kiana mix or become confused? We don't have to admit to a human knuma to talk about activities related to the human kiana. For the Orthodox, the activities of the human kiana are expressed by the divine knuma. They are expressed by Christ himself directly in the most literal sense. For the Assyrian Church of the East, the human activities must be expressed by the human knuma. And likewise, the divine activities must be expressed by the divine knuma. The Assyrian Church of the East wants to essentially be able to associate both divine and human activities with Christ, but through the respective knume, in order to preserve the two kiane from mingling and confusion. However, there are serious problems for the Assyrian Church of the East when trying to associate activities with a particular subsistence. You have two potential scenarios. One, divine and human activities subsist in the person of Christ. In other words, Christ himself, and not the knume in Christ, is the causal agent of both divine and human activities. 
or two, divine and human activities subsist in the respective knume, and Christ is just the means for visibly manifesting the activities. In other words, the divine knuma is the causal agent of divine activities, and the human knuma is the causal agent of human activities. And these activities are simply made visibly manifest through Christ. So Christ himself, in the strictest sense, is not the direct causal agent of any activity. The first scenario is not feasible for the express reason that the Assyrian Church of the East does not consider the person of Christ to be its own subsistence. Nestorius is extremely, extremely, extremely clear in his teaching that the person of Christ is not a distinct subsistence, but that the Logos is a distinct divine subsistence, and that Jesus is a distinct human subsistence. I'll come back to this in a more in more detail shortly. So if Christ himself is not a distinct subsistence, then he cannot be the direct causal agent of any activity. Moreover, if Christ himself were actually to be directly the causal agent of his activities, as opposed to the knume serving this role, then it begs the question, how then would knuma be functionally different from kiana? In this scheme, if the knuma is not a subsistence, in other words, it is not the causal agent for its respective activities, being instead replaced by the person of Christ, then it is completely superfluous to Kiana. There's no functional difference. At this point, you're just playing meaningless word games and being a sophist trying to distinguish Knuma from Kiana. But on the other hand, if each Knuma does indeed represent a subsistence as per the second scenario, then attributing any activity to Christ himself directly is in the strictest sense false attribution because all you are doing is masking the respective knume. Yes, Christ may seem uh, be seen to perform the activity, but Christ is not the causal agent of that activity. In reality, it is the individual knume in Christ that are the causes of the activities, which are just made visibly manifest through the singular Christ. In this case, this is functionally the exact same as saying there are two existences or two persons within Christ, using Christ as essentially a filter to visibly manifest activity. The two knume are functionally indistinguishable from two persons. The singular Christ serves as merely a medium by which the activity is made visibly manifest. Christ is functionally nothing more than a passive receptacle for the individual knume. Syriac speakers of the Assyrian Church of the East often get hung up on the language and ultimately fail to grasp this theology and also fail to realize that we do not serve the Syriac language. 
The Syriac language serves us. Proper theology needs to be expressible in all languages, not just Syriac. We do not adapt our theology to language. We redefine language to represent our theology. This is what happened in the Greek tradition. The Orthodox Church did not sacrifice theology because of the existing Greek language and nomenclature. The Orthodox Church redefined the Greek language and nomenclature to reflect proper theology. So if the existing Syriac language doesn't reflect proper theology, for example, one's conception of knuma, then you don't sacrifice your theology for the sake of the Syriac language. You redefine the Syriac language to reflect proper theology. You redefine what is meant by knuma. You don't force an antiquated understanding of knuma to describe Christ. You can't make the argument that, oh, it sounds illogical to the Syriac ear to say such and such. The incarnation is a mystery. Therefore, it necessitates that language be redefinable, be adaptable to better convey this mystery. We do not make the mystery of the incarnation contingent on Syriac linguistics. Using the existing Syriac nomenclature of the Assyrian Church of the East to say Christ has a divine knuma and a human knuma means that there are two subjects in Christ, two concrete existences in Christ. That is Nestorianism. No ifs, ands, or buts. That is Nestorianism. That is the Nestorian heresy. The Assyrian Church of the East, by its own constraints, cannot say that Christ has a divine knuma and a human knuma and at the same time deny a divine subsistence and a human subsistence. Whether that human knuma is self-subsistent or non-self-subsistent is an altogether different issue. Those who say the human knuma is self-subsistent are labeled Nestorians, while those who say the human knuma is non-self-subsistent are labeled Orientals. But the fact remains the Assyrian Church of the East is forced by its own constraints to admit that a human knuma implies a distinct human subsistence in Christ. And as long as the Assyrian Church of the East continues to hold to that Christology, and it can't say it doesn't because this is what Nestorius taught and Nestorius is considered a blameless saint in that church, then union with the Orthodox Church remains at an impasse. While there are issues peculiar to Oriental theology, which I'm not going to go into here, the fact also remains that the Oriental churches also hold to some kind of human subsistence in Christ. So union with the Orthodox Church likewise remains at an impasse. However, Oriental theology is actually in many regards closer to Orthodox theology. St. John of Damascus recognized that laity, and I'm going to stress laity because it doesn't apply to the clergy, but laity of the Oriental churches can actually be received into communion within the Orthodox Church merely through confession. The Oriental heresy for laity as it applies 
um, does not rise to the level of placing one outside of the church. However, Nestorians and the Assyrian Church of the East, by extension, are altogether considered to be outside of the church. That's how damning the Nestorian heresy really is. Apart from all this, let's not forget and lose sight of the fact that, especially as it concerns Nestorius, the discussion is not ultimately about the Syriac Knuma. Nestorius and countless others knew Greek and communicated in Greek. Their theology was expressed firsthand in Greek. Nestorius's writings were originally in Greek and only later translated into Syriac. Therefore, the Greek hypostasis is just as much a heritage of the Assyrian Church of the East as is the Syriac Knuma. So do not let proponents of the Assyrian Church of the East distract you with arguments surrounding the Syriac Knuma as if this word has some sort of special, magical, mystical meaning that only the Assyrian Church of the East knows about and it is a panacea that will resolve disagreements. No, we Orthodox very much understand what the Assyrian Church of the East means when it says Knuma. And no way can the Assyrian Church of the East, with its understanding of the person of Christ, cash out Knuma without admitting to Nestorianism. Some people may make the counter-argument that the term hypostasis itself evolved over time. This is true. The term did evolve. Hypostasis did not always have the same connotation. But what we find in the patristic writings and the acts of the ecumenical councils, mm -hmm. especially as it concerns Nestorius, there are plenty of surrounding words and explanations used in supplement alongside each other to clearly delineate the intended meanings as well as very clear descriptive surrounding language that leaves no room for ambiguity how hypostasis is to be understood in the respective context. Now, Nestorianism is exemplified not only by Nestorius, but by a continuous theological tradition as represented by prominent figures such as Diodore of Tarsus, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodore of Cyrus, Ibas of Edessa, Marbabai the Great, and Ilya of Nisibis, to name just a handful, all of whom are revered in the Assyrian Church of the East. Some of them are even considered saints. For example, Nestorius is a saint in the Assyrian Church of the East, and has a church service performed in his name every October 25th. If you think of it like lit Liturgy of Nestorius, if you will. We identify the general theological thought of the named individuals and the Assyrian Church of the East by the term Nestorian simply because of Nestorius's prominent role and fame as Bishop of Constantinople and the events surrounding his life. While he did contribute to the development of the theology that bears his name, ultimately the general thrust of the theology known as Nestorianism both precedes him and succeeds him as part of an, an inherited tradition among so-called Nestorians. Nestorianism is rooted in equivocating on the term person, or prosopon in Greek, parsupa in Syriac. Nestorians, ironically, have two 
meanings of this word. When the Assyrian Church of the East says it believes that Christ is one person, they do not mean it in the orthodox sense of a single hypostasis, a single knuma, a single subject. In the two volumes, a Nestorian collection of Christological texts, Louise Abramovsky quotes Nestorius. The Blessed Theodore, here Nestorius is referring to Theodore of Mopsuestia, his teacher, speaks as follows. Prosopon, person, is used in a twofold way. For either it signifies the hypostasis and that which each one of us is, or it is conferred upon honor, greatness, and worship. For example, Paul and Peter signify hypostasis and the prosopon of each one of them, but the prosopon of our Lord Christ means honor, greatness, and worship. Nestorius subsequently writes, For the honor is neither nature nor hypostasis. Further on in the same text, Nestorius writes, Hypostasis and prosopon are one and the same when applied successively to men. But when we apply prosopon to our Lord Christ, that is, to the two natures of the Godhead and of the manhood, it is not one compounded hypostasis that is referred to in the ordinary way, but it, namely the prosopon, signifies honor and greatness and worship. So Nestorius is telling us that person can mean either hypostasis or signification of honor and greatness and worship. The Assyrian Church of the East relies on this equivocation and possible word concept fallacy when engaging in dialogue with other churches. It purports to hold the same Christology as other churches so long as the terminology is left vague and open to interpretation. For example, there is the 1994 Joint Christological Declaration between the Assyrian Church of the East and the Vatican. In this declaration, the term person is used with respect to Christ, but nowhere is it defined. Yet we know that Nestorius clearly recognized two radically different meanings of the term person, which leads to different theologies. The situation is reminiscent when St. Cyril wrote a letter to Nestorius with regards to the Nicene Creed. Both St. Cyril and Nestorius held the Nicene Creed in common, the exact same wording. Nonetheless, St. Cyril explicitly criticized Nestorius for misunderstanding and misinterpreting it. So joint declarations between the Assyrian Church of the East and, the, and other churches are effectually meaningless if the theology itself is not clearly elaborated. These agreements are just agreements on words. They are not agreements on what those words actually mean. Ashari Muslims and Salafi Muslims both agree to the words of the Qur'an, 
but each camp has very different understandings of what those words actually mean. Is the hand of Allah symbolic in that it represents the power of Allah? Or is the hand of Allah a real hand? Bila kaif, Allahu alam. The Assyrian Church of the East will point to the joint declaration with the Vatican, but what the Assyrian Church of the East will not tell you is that in 430 AD, Celestine, the Bishop of Rome, officially delegated authority to St. Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, to act in the name and authority of the Bishopric of Rome in demanding Nestorius conform to St. Cyril's Christology. And in the event that Nestorius refused to do so within 10 days of being notified, that St. Cyril was to act with official authority in the name of the Bishop of Rome in addition to his official authority as Bishop of Alexandria to depose Nestorius. Celestine was explicit that Nestorius was to conform specifically to the Christology as formulated by St. Cyril. The Assyrian Church of the East in no way, shape, or form exhibits the Christology of St. Cyril. Is anyone from the Assyrian Church of the East really going to claim that its theology is representative of St. Cyril, especially when Nestorius considered St. Cyril to be the one in error? The Bishop of Rome, Celestine, wrote directly to Nestorius with utmost disgust. He was appalled at the heresies being espoused by Nestorius. Celestine even points out the fact that these are not rumors or accusations about Nestorius, but that they come as letters by the hand of Nestorius himself that he sent to Celestine. Is the Assyrian Church of the East really going to claim that the Bishop of Rome, Celestine, himself misunderstood Nestorius? That Nestorius didn't really teach Nestorianism? Now, in modern day, the Vatican has a lot of political reasons to do what it does ecumenically. As a result, a lot of its actions can hardly be motivated by theology, especially when you have embarrassments like the idol worship of Pachamama, the Pope kissing the Quran, and even the Pope signing a joint declaration in 2008 with Muslims that basically acknowledges Muhammad as a prophet and the Quran as a holy book. Having a joint declaration today with the Vatican doesn't really mean anything. But in 430 AD, Rome stood for orthodoxy. The Bishop of Rome actually meant something. Consider Celestine's powerful language when he writes to Nestorius. Now bear with me, this is going to be a lengthy quote from his letter. How could you apply words to questions that it is blasphemous to have conceived? How could a bishop teach to congregations things that undermine reverence towards the virgin birth? The purity of the ancient faith ought not to be sullied by blasphemous words against God. Who at any time escaped anathema if he added to or subtracted from it? For what has been handed down to us fully and clearly by the apostles needs neither addition nor diminution. We have read in our books that one should neither add nor subtract. Great indeed is the penalty that descends on the one who adds or subtracts. Consequently, we are preparing cautery and knife because wounds that deserve to be cut out should no longer be treated. 
we know for certain that greater defects are always cured by greater pain. Among the many things you have preached impiously and the universal church rejects, we particularly deplore the excision from the creed handed down by the apostles of those words that give us hope of a fullness of life and salvation. How this could come about is revealed by your letter, which leaves no room for doubt since you yourself sent it. We could have wished that it had not come into our hands in order not to be compelled to condemn so great a crime. The paths of all your disputation have concluded with a summary of them. You expiated broadly and followed many twisting paths, but belatedly and by a different route, you have reached an impious goal. I want you to understand that you have been totally expelled from the universal fellowship of bishops and the assembly of Christians unless what was wrongly said is promptly corrected and unless you return to that way which Christ professes himself to be. Not only do you not give food in due season, but you even kill with poison those whom he sought through his blood and his death. For there is poison on your lips, which we see to be full of cursing and bitterness when you strive to dispute against the one who is mild. Where is pastoral diligence? The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, but he is a hireling who lets them loose and betrays them to wolves. What are you going to do here as shepherd when you adopt the wolf's role and rend the Lord's flock? To what pen can the holy flock now flee if it comes to harm within the very sheepfold of the church? How will it be protected when it finds in you a predator rather than a guardian? It is a grim fact that the words of the blessed Paul in the Acts of the Apostles apply to you. I know, he says, that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter among you, not sparing the flock, and from yourselves will arise men speaking perversely to seduce disciples after them. We would wish that this had been said by you about others and not by others about you. For what we are saying is something that should have been for you to teach and not for you to learn. For who can bear a bishop being taught how to be a Christian? Look carefully at the role for, um, sorry, for which you are summoned. You are arraigned, you are reproved, you are accused. Which of these suits a priest? Harshness calls for a harsh response, if indeed punishing blasphemy counts as retaliation. Or do you think that we should spare you, although you yourself are so far from sparing your own soul that you wish everyone in the past, present, and future to be deprived of the gift of salvation? As the faithful servant of my good master, I must openly pursue his foes, since the prophet affirms that he hated them with a perfect hatred. I am again advised by another speaker not to spare. Who here should command my respect? To whom should I show some honor when what is at issue is the removal of the ground of all my hope? The gospel contains the Lord's own words in which he says that neither father nor mother nor children nor any need should be preferred to him. I hear that the clergy, Catholic in their beliefs, with whom we are in communion, suffer extreme violence in that the city itself is forbidden to them. We rejoice that they are winning the reward for confessors, but lament that it is as a result of persecution by a bishop. The blessed Apostle Paul changed from a persecutor to a preacher. It is utterly abominable that a preacher has become a persecutor. We have approved and approve 
the faith of the bishop of the Church of Alexandria. And you who have been admonished by him must again share our beliefs if you wish to share our fellowship. If you are to demonstrate agreement with this brother, condemning everything you have held hitherto, we require you to preach at once what you see him to preach. To the clergy also of the Church of Constantinople and all who bear the name of Christian, we have sent such a letter as was needed so that if you obstinately persist in perverse opposition and do not preach what our brother Cyril preaches along with us, they may know that you have been excluded from our fellowship and are out of communion with us. Therefore, be fully aware of this our sentence. Unless you preach about Christ our God, that which is held by both the Roman and Alexandrian and the Universal Catholic Church, and what was also most firmly held by the Holy Church of the city of Constantinople until you, and by a public and written profession condemn the perfidious novelty that tries to divide what venerable scripture unites by the tenth day counting from the first day of this indictment becoming known to you, you are to be aware that you are expelled from the communion of the universal Catholic Church. Wow! 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 That is the Bishop of Rome writing directly to Nestorius. The Assyrian Church of the East is so proud of its joint declaration with the Vatican purporting to espouse the same, same theology. Well, how about the Assyrian Church of the East also publish side by side with that joint declaration Celestine's letter to Nestorius with big bold letters across the page. Celestine got it wrong. I mean, come on. Nestorius is a blameless saint, innocent and wrongly convicted. That's the position of the Assyrian Church of the East. So why not just come out officially and tell us that Celestine, the Bishop of Rome in 430 AD, was wrong? That the Quran-kissing, Pachamama, idol-worshipping clown popes in today's Vatican know theology better than Celestine and St. Cyril? In his first letter to Celestine, Nestorius writes, We reject applying the term Theotokos, for the nativity was consubstantial with the one giving birth, while his manifestation in a human being resulted from the creation of the Lord's manhood joined to the Godhead. So Nestorius is teaching two subjects in Christ. The manhood joins to the Godhead in Christ, each maintaining their respective subjectivity. Christ is a single outward product of the conjunction. For Nestorius Christ is not the Word alone, nor is he Jesus alone. Moreover, the person of Christ encompasses more than the person of the Word alone and more than the person of Jesus alone. Christ is not coextensive with either. In his second letter to Celestine, Nestorius writes, Christotokos, for this expression uses a name that signifies both natures, namely Christ, and it conjoins Godhead and manhood in one adoration, since the Godhead of the Son is consubstantial with the Godhead of the Father. While the manhood was born at a later time, 
from the Holy Virgin, and because of its conjunction with the Godhead, is worshipped together with it by men and angels. In contrast, Orthodox Christians do not worship something together in Christ. We worship Christ, which is to say we worship the Word who is the Son, who is Jesus, who is Christ. We have only one subject, the divine hypostasis, or person of God, the Word. The Word became flesh, not the Word became a new person. Christ, who is the Word, and hypostatizes human nature by his divine person, and so does not take unto himself a human hypostasis. The two natures in Christ are united hypostatically in the divine person of the Word. The divine person of God the Word is the means by which the two natures are united. In the language of Chalcedon, Christ gifts the divine mode of being to human nature. In other words, the potential of human nature is realized in the divine way of being. The divine subsistence is the subsistence for the human nature. This is the incarnation. This is the mystery of the incarnation. The Father anhypostatizes divine nature, ase. The Son anhypostatizes divine nature through begetting. And the Holy Spirit anhypostatizes divine nature through spiration. Now, the Son anhypostatizes human nature by incarnating. Notice the parallel of how the Son anhypostatizes the divine and human natures, begetting from the Father and being born of a mother. What happens Christologically has its typology in triadology. Moreover, because Christ does not have a human hypostasis, his anhypostatization of human nature is universal. Therefore, salvation is accessible to all who have human nature. Were Christ to have a human hypostasis, then salvation would be an extreme case akin to some sort of limited atonement restricted to Christ alone. In other words, Christ would save only Christ. But by gifting the divine mode of being to human nature universally at the level of nature, not at the level of hypostasis, all humans can be saved. It is not that Christ is just consubstantial with humanity, but that his anhypostatization of human nature universally transfigures human nature at a fundamental level. This is why Christ's incarnation is salvific. This is why Christ's incarnation has to be a real incarnation of the divine Logos, not just a superficial prosopic conjoining with humanity. If universal human nature is not fundamentally transfigured universally, then there is no point to the incarnation. The incarnation is not salvific. 
Christ is not, like Nestorius claimed, a product, the culmination of two subjects or two hypostases or two knume coming together in a so-called prosopic conjunction. Jesus, according to Nestorius, is a separate subsistence created at a point in space-time and given worship not for who he is in and of himself, but for the fact that he is joined to the divine word, an altogether distinct existence. Nestorius is explicit that the human Jesus is not, is not the divine word. The person of Jesus is not coextensive with the divine person of God, the Word. What this means is that Jesus is worshipped by association. It is the prosopic conjoining of the divine Word and the human Jesus in the singular Christ that allows worship of the Nestorian human hypostasis Jesus. How is this not just a sophisticated form of idolatry? Consider what St. Cyril of Alexandria, representing the Orthodox position, writes in his letter to Nestorius. We do not worship a man together with the word, lest a semblance of division might creep in through the use of the word with but we worship him as one and the same because the body with which he is enthroned with the Father is not alien to the Word. In response, Nestorius writes in his second letter to St. Cyril a very explicit, unambiguous, and complete denial of communicatio idiomatum. For I do not understand how it, the hypostatic union, could introduce the one declared earlier to be impassable and incapable of a second birth as, again, passable and newly created, as if the natural properties of God the Word are destroyed by conjunction with the temple, or as if it is thought a trivial thing by men that the sinless temple inseparable from the divine nature, should undergo birth and death on behalf of sinners. In other words, Nestorius is arguing against making such statements as God was born, God was crucified, God died, God resurrected, God ascended. The primary concern for Nestorius is to avoid negating divine impassibility. So to him, each person or hypostasis or knuma of the conjunction is strictly identified with the nature so that the result, according to him, would not be a confusion of natures. God was not born. God was not crucified. God did not die. God did not resurrect. God did not ascend. Rather, Christ was born, Christ was crucified, Christ died, Christ resurrected, Christ ascended. This is not a misunderstanding, whether Greek or Syriac. If Nestorius considered the Word to be the sole subject in Christ, the sole subject of the Incarnation, then it is impossible for him to deny communicatio idiomatum. Therefore, Nestorius is teaching a fundamentally different Christology to that of St. Cyril, to that of Orthodoxy. There is no fanciful or magical, mystical meaning of the Syriac knuma lost in translation, that can rectify this fundamental Christological difference. Perhaps the most unambiguous and crystal clear statement on the correctness of a single subject Christology is found in St. Cyril's letter to Emperor Theodosius, 
We maintain that a convergence occurred, an indescribable concurrence that brought about a unity between otherwise unequal and dissimilar natures, although we recognize a single Christ, Lord and Son, at the same time both God and man, both in reality and conceptually. We continue to hold that this unity is wholly unbreakable, since we believe that the only begotten and the firstborn are the same individual. About a hundred years later, the Emperor St. Justinian echoes St. Cyril when he writes, Nor do we believe that the divine Logos and Christ are different persons. But we confess that the Lord Jesus Christ and the divine Logos are one and the same. And so, although we say there are two different natures in one and the same only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, we do not propose two sons or hypostases or prosopa. And at the same time, we confess his one hypostasis, despising the division of Nestorius. The Fifth Ecumenical Council, in turn, echoes St. Justinian when it proclaims, If anyone understands the expression, one only person of our Lord Jesus Christ in this sense, that it is the union of many hypostases. And if he attempts thus to introduce into the mystery of Christ two hypostases or two persons, and after having introduced two persons, speaks of one person only out of dignity, honor, or worship, as both Theodorus and Nestorius insanely have written, let him be anathema. St. Cyril's fourth anathema in his third letter to Nestorius unambiguously encapsulates the error of believing in a two-subject Christology. If anyone ascribes to two persons or hypostases, the sayings in the Gospels and apostolic writings, let him be anathema. Furthermore, if one were to advance the ridiculous claim that it was really Nestorius who was misunderstood, whether in Greek or Syriac, then one needs to explain why the entire Nestorian camp, not just Nestorius himself, actually accused St. Cyril's Christology of heresy, equating it with Apollinarianism. Nestorius took issue with St. Cyril for the latter's insistence on a single subject Christology. So it's kind of difficult for anyone to argue that Nestorius taught a single subject Christology. If he did, he wouldn't have considered St. Cyril a heretic. Connected to all this, Nestorians have historically considered it heretical to call Mary by the term Theotokos, or God-bearer, in isolation, because to them it is indicative of either the Apollinarian or Arian heresies. This conflation makes it impossible to consider seriously that the matter is a one-way misunderstanding of Nestorius by the Orthodox, or the ridiculous assertion that the Orthodox do not understand what is meant by the Syriac knuma, completely disregarding the fact that Nestorius communicated in Greek. There is no misunderstanding. The issue is a fundamental disagreement on Christology. 
even to the present day in 2016, you have individuals like Dr. Mar Aprem Mukin, the Metropolitan of Malabar in India of the Assyrian Church of the East, who officially in writing denounces the singular Orthodox appellation Theotokos. Consider, for example, when he writes, the necessity for a Nestorian Christology becomes inevitable when we think of the greatest position ascribed to the Virgin Mary in the Roman Catholic Church. The fear expressed by Nestorius against the use of Theotokos should not be ignored. It is one of the positive contributions of Nestorius to have exposed the potential danger of this title. Now, the Roman Catholic Church may well have gone off the deep end with its Mariolatry insanity, but the Orthodox have not. The Orthodox preserve to this very day the honor, dignity, and veneration of Mary in the same way as the early church and the apostles. Mukin continues later on, as far back as our records of history go, there was nobody to speak against this title before 428 AD, though it was used by certain individuals. Now, just a side note, 428 AD is the year when Nestorius became bishop of Constantinople and immediately started publicly denouncing the use of Theotokos and persecuting those who used it. Continuing, Perhaps it would have become the standard expression of all Christians if Nestorius did not wage such a crusade against this title. Till the Reformation in the 16th century, the Church of the East was the only church which shared the concern of Nestorius against the use of Theotokos. Since the Reformation, however, many churches share this attitude, and thus the position taken by the Church of the East singularly down through the centuries is vindicated. Vindicated? Okay, so according to Mukin, we are going to use the Reformation and thousands of Protestant sects that all teach different theologies as the measuring stick for the correctness in denouncing the title Theotokos? Is this guy for real? Is this the level of intellectual rigor we should expect from a metropolitan? Later on, he continues, as for the Mariology, it, the Assyrian Church of the East, refuses to call Mary Theotokos, unlike the Orthodox Church. However, despite the refusal to use the title Theotokos to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Nestorian churches throughout the world are in general agreement with the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox churches in giving respect and veneration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. A Nestorian is an Orthodox without Theotokos. So in his capacity as an official representative of the Assyrian Church of the East in this modern day, Metropolitan Mukin explicitly and unambiguously promotes Nestorius's crusade against the singular appellation Theotokos. In denying the term Theotokos in such strong terms, Mukin is also condemning great saints and monumental pillars and defenders of the Orthodox Church like Saint Athanasius, Saint Basil the Great, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, Saint Gregory Nazianzus, all of whom predate Nestorius and without hesitation used the singular appellation Theotokos for Mary. And the Assyrian Church of the East expects us to take it seriously when it says we are the ones who misunderstand Nestorius? The Assyrian Church of the East follows Nestorius in calling Mary Christotokos, which, by the way, is a term that Nestorius invented. 
and by it means theotokos plus anthropotokos. This is partly why Celestine so harshly rebukes Nestorius. Under no circumstances whatsoever does the Orthodox Church recognize Mary as anthropotokos or man bear because the term anthropotokos implies a human hypostasis or human knuma. This appellation was peculiar to Nestorius and the clergy he brought with him to Constantinople. If Orthodox Christians were to use the term Christotokos, then it would be strictly synonymous with Theotokos and only Theotokos, because there is only one subject in Christ, the person of the divine word, the Logos and would not be subject to rebuke by Celestine. This is in opposition to the Assyrian Church of the East, which teaches that Mary as Christotokos is Theotokos plus Anthropotokos, in other words, two subjects in Christ. Nestorius is teaching that Mary is Theotokos and Anthropotokos is not explainable as a misunderstanding of the Syriac Knuma. Theotokos plus Anthropotokos refer to two hypostases, two Knume, two concrete existences. Orthodoxy unreservedly rejects the term Anthropotokos. Therefore, Nestorius and the Assyrian Church of the East teach a completely different Christology to that of Orthodoxy. Let's also consider a couple of examples of what other prominent theologians of the Assyrian Church of the East say. There is Mar Babai the Great. If we say of the two natures that they were united in one prosopon, not declaring expressly two hypostases with them, we are saying that the whole nature of the Trinity was united, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the whole nature of men was united, Jesus, Judas, and Simon. For concerning one of the hypostases of the Trinity, that is God the Word, he took from us the man Jesus as one hypostasis and joined and united it to himself. Here we also see Babai's confusion over nature and person where he is basically espousing a modalist theology. Then there is Theodoret of Cyrus in his letter to John of Antioch as a direct response to St. Cyril's third letter of anathemas to Nestorius. Given that the natures are both complete things that nonetheless came together in the same individual, it is reasonable to acknowledge a single person, while to refer to the united, concrete, existences, plural, is not inappropriate, but is actually a necessary consequence. During Islamic times, Bishop of the Assyrian Church of the East, Ilya of Nisibis, in his dialogue with the vizier, Abul Qasim al-Maghribi of the Marwana dynasty, goes so far as to claim that his church's Christology is compatible with Islamic Tawheed. To prove this compatibility, he relies on the uniquely Nestorian conception of Hulul, or divine indwelling, wherein the divine word indwells the human Jesus in a similar but superior way that God is considered to have generally indwelt in the prophets. 
he makes it an explicit point that the Melkites and Jacobites, i.e. the Orthodox and Orientals, respectively, differ with his church on this doctrine in that they reject it because they hold to an altogether different Christology. Elia also asserts the position that his church, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Nestorian Church, represents the true Ahlal Kitab, or people of the book mentioned in the Quran. He makes forceful arguments in this regard in order to avoid the growing sentiment among Muslims that present-day Christians at the same at the time are in fact not Ahlal Kitab, that they are Kufar and therefore not protected against jihad by Muslims. Ilya is looking to safeguard his own Nestorian community by making it unambiguously clear that the Assyrian Church of the East teaches a different Christology to that of the Orthodox and the Orientals. It is the Orthodox and the Orientals who are the Kufar. Ilya argues with the vizier that specifically the Nestorian conception of Christ and the Holy Trinity are compatible with normative Islam. In modern times, in 2007, Marba Y. Soro, then Bishop of the Assyrian Church of the East, summarizes Nestorius' theology that Nestorius himself exposits in his Bazaar of Heraclides. Point one, the union of divinity and of humanity in Christ is voluntary. However, this union is neither moral nor spiritual. It is the result of joining two persons together. And then further on in point seven, the principle of this union is to be found in the combined prosopa of divinity and of humanity, namely in the revealed prosopon of Christ incarnate the person of the union. Soro cuts through the linguistic BS and recognizes Nestorius explicitly teaching two persons in Christ. He also demonstrates within the same sentence how Nestorians equivocate on the term person. The Assyrian Church of the East has historically explicitly taught that its Christology is different to that of the Orthodox Church. Yet nowadays in modern times, with meaningless joint declarations, it wants us to believe that everything historically is all just a big misunderstanding and that we all actually believe the same thing? No. We don't believe the same thing, and the Assyrian Church of the East can't have it both ways. The Assyrian Church of the East can say all day long that Christ is Had Parsupa, one person. But that Had Parsupa for the Assyrian Church of the East, for Nestorius, does not mean the Orthodox one hypostasis, one knuma, one subsistence, one subject. The Assyrian Church of the East can talk about Knuma as much as it wants, but it's not going to solve the disagreements on communicatio idiomatum, the Theotokos, Hulul, and a host of other disagreements. The theology of the Assyrian Church of the East is in no way remotely close to that of the Orthodox Church, the Church that Christ is himself established. Nestorius was rightfully condemned as a heretic, and the Assyrian Church of the East deserves the Nestorian appellation in the pejorative heretical sense because it is Nestorian in every sense of the word. I'll end today's presentation on that note, despite that I've only 
begun to scratch the surface. There are many other things that I could talk about to round out the discussion further. For example, um, the sacraments, biblical exegesis, analyzing various Christological scenarios, uh, go into greater historical detail, go into uh, greater depth into the source material, all of which would further accentuate demonstration of the heirs of Nestorius and the Assyrian Church of the East. I might do a future follow-up video on this stuff, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not particularly interested to do an exhaustive expose on the Assyrian Church of the East. I think I've made my case in this video. What interests me more is to instead look in greater depth at some of the historical Christian-Muslim theological exchanges, um, especially in the formative years of Islam. So really unpack the theologies and theological discourses of individuals like um, St. John of Damascus, uh, Theodore Abukura, and possibly even uh, the Nestorian Elia of Nisibis. We'll see. Uh, just to wrap up, for those of you who might be interested to read up more on some of the stuff I presented. In addition to the sources I already mentioned during the presentation, uh, here's a small selection of highly recommended books. This is by no means an exhaustive list, just a good place where to start if you want to know more about the stuff I was talking about in the stream. So let me just grab it here. So the first one, I'll just hold it up here so you can see it, okay? The Council of Ephesus of 431 by um, Richard Price, very historically oriented, very thorough, very reputed scholarship, very thrilling, basically reads like Game of Thrones. You get exposed to all the personalities of the time, what they said, how they plotted, how they schemed, how Nestorius insulted the royal court, how Nestorius burned churches and terrorized the inhabitants of Constantinople. A very informative book, very highly recommended. Then there is this one, On the Person of Christ, The Christology of Emperor Justinian, translated by Kenneth Wesche. Uh, this is a very, very, very good primer on Orthodox theology, one of the absolute best, certainly one of my favorites, clearly lays out Orthodox theology and contrasts it with the theologies of Nestorians and Orientals. Very pleasant read. Solid, solid, solid foundational primary source material. Easily in my top 10, perhaps even top five of absolute must read for anyone who is Orthodox or interested in Orthodoxy. The next one, I'll hold it up here that you guys can see it. Um, okay, St. Cyril of Alexandria, Three Christological Treatises. Uh, part of the Fathers of the Church series. Uh, this one is a bit more advanced, a bit more technical and nuanced. Um, this one is also in my top 10 of absolute must-reads. It's one of those books that you will keep coming back to. It doesn't matter how many times you've read it. It's very rich, very good, very solid foundational primary source material on St. Cyril's Christology. Okay. Then there is this one here. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy by Father John McGuckin. Um, this is pretty much the gold standard for understanding St. Cyril from the Orthodox perspective. Very thorough, very comprehensive, very authoritative. Uh, this is another one on my top 10 of absolute must-reads. God is One by uh, Michael F. Kuhn. Okay, basically a good primer on the Nestorian church under Islamic rule. Nothing too spectacular about it, but it's a respectable place to start, especially if you want to follow up on what I was saying with regards to the Nestorian bishop, Ilya of Nisibis. Uh, for Nestorian-centric material, there is Nestorius's own Bazaar of Heraclides, which I already mentioned, uh, the Christology of Theodoret of Cyrus by Paul Clayton Jr., uh, the case against Theodore and Theodore by John Baer. Uh, sorry, I don't have any of these in hard copy to show you on screen. Um, I have them as PDFs. Uh, there are numerous other sources. Personally, I find the Nestorian stuff is really not all that interesting or extensive, especially once you have a solid foundation in orthodoxy. 
I would honestly encourage people to first ground themselves firmly in proper Orthodox theology and then consume whatever Nestorian source material you come across. It's really important to first properly understand Orthodoxy so that you can easily immediately identify all the Nestorian and Assyrian Church of the East BS, whether it's equivocation, word concept fallacy, uh, rehabilitating Nestorius, uh, Nestorius was misunderstood, Nestorius was the real victim, uh, Syriac pneuma, and a whole host of other nonsense. It's easy to get swayed by the pro-Nestorian material as some of it can be very deceptive, especially if you aren't properly grounded in Orthodox theology. That's about it. Uh, thank you all for listening. It is truly meet to bless thee, the Theotokos, ever blessed and most blameless, and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gavest birth to God the word, the very Theotokos, thee do we magnify. Peace unto all who are in Christ. Amen. Shlama am kulchun Eileen, tum shichanun. Amen.